Um, this is very much a talk about uh, security. It's a talk about workflows. And uh, it's a talk about tooling. It's a talk about how to handle dependencies in a way where you're sure of what you're doing and uh, what you're actually deploying. So um, that's me. I'm, well, I'm actually in front of you, so the picture's a bit redundant. Um, that's also my Twitter and GitHub account. Uh, I, I know people think that it's a joke, but uh, my like, sense of self-worth is very strongly connected to my Twitter uh, follower account, so please follow me. Uh, I work for a company called Duffel. It's a UK-based startup. Um, and basically, with the Duffel API, anyone can sell flights from 20 plus airlines with uh, one super simple integration. So you should definitely check it out. OK, so this is the agenda. I want to give you sort of an idea of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I want to start by just briefly going through sort of the history of dependencies, um, not very specific, just really general, and um, like how we got to where we are today. And then we're going to move over to talk about attacks um, and some examples of what they look like. And once we've you know, established that that's a problem, uh, talk about how, what we can do to prevent that problem, prevent those attacks. And uh, if you haven't heard of hex diff, this will be the announcing hex diff talk. <laughs> uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll finish off with some takeaways. Uh, okay, so introduction. So I mentioned that this is a talk about security, and it very much is. But security is such a broad and complicated and vague subject, and it means so many different things to different people. Uh, I used to work for a security company, and when people asked me what I did, and I said security, they're like, oh yeah, like physical security, right? And I mean, no, I, I don't look, do, do I look like a bodyguard? I don't really, I don't get that. Um, but yeah, if you talk to someone who works with penetration testing, that's what security is. If you talk to someone who does compliance, that's what security is. It's so broad and it means so many different things. Um, but this is very much a talk about security today. And I want to get to the point where we have sort of a shared understanding of what dependencies are like. So I mean, if you go back, if you think about like what dependencies used to be like, um, I guess, or rather not, rather you didn't really have dependencies. If you just go back, people didn't really share a lot of code. It wasn't the original state of things. You um, worked for a company, you developed proprietary software that was owned by the company, and um, if you had to switch jobs and you had to build something similar, you'd build it again. Uh, whenever you needed something, you built that software. And out of this sort of frustration, is like, that's part of where open source software and the free software movements sort of came from. Um, I'm just going to say open source after, after this because, you know, we kind of know who, who won. Um, but we all very much rely on dependencies. That's what we do today. We, just glue together a bunch of finished pieces of software, that's what software engineering is. And that's what enables us to get so far so quickly with so little effort. Um, and it used to be that you, know, you got access to some dependencies and what you had to do was download them and put them in your project. Um, this is generally known as, as vendoring, which in some communities is, or has until recently still been considered state of the art. Um, but for most of us, we're a little bit lacier than that. And we, as you know, you rely on more and more pieces of software for your program to run or uh, packages of software, uh, you need a way to maintain that. You need software that helps you maintain that. And I think the first example of an actual like proper package registry with a package manager is CPAN. I'm not, like, don't quote me on it, but I think it is. It was, uh, went live in 1995. So that's the Perl uh, package registry. And in many ways, it was considered Perl's killer app. It's what popularized uh, Perl. 
And I mean, today you see it with modern languages too. One of the first things that the Rust uh, community did was they made a package manager. That's one of the key features of a language today. You don't really have a, a productive programming language and community without a package manager. And when we're talking about package registries and package managers, we can't avoid talking about NPM. Um, we make a lot of fun of NPM, I think, in general. Uh, but th there's a good reason for why all the bad things happen there first. Um, and that can clearly be seen on this website that shows the number of packages per uh, registry. I've just selected a few that I thought were interesting. So right there at the bottom, that straight line that doesn't really like, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't, even, doesn't even move, that's, that's hex. And what's ridiculous is that, like Michal pointed out, that's 10,000 packages. That's so much software. That's so much, that's, uh, so much code that people shared and that you can reuse and that you can build things with. And we all know that there is plenty of really, really good software available in the Elixir uh, ecosystem. But in comparison to some other registries that's uh, very small, the next one, the green one, is confusingly RubyGems. Uh, you kind of expect those colors to be switched. Uh, and you see that uh, PyPy is the next one after that, which is just over 200,000. But then the blue line is NPM, which is up to almost 1.2 million packages. And I think if you look at, I think I read an article about NPM from like last year, and NPM was at like 600, 700,000 packages, and now it's at 1.2 million. It's growing so quickly. Um, and part of that is, I mean, they kind of brought it on themselves. It's, that's part of the community, is having this idea of micro packages, where a single package might only have a few lines of code, a single function that it exports. And uh, to build software, you add a bunch of different packages into your system. And that causes some problems that we're going to get into. So I don't know if you've read this article, but it's a lot of fun. and. Uh, Basically, it's sort of written as a fictional uh, story by a hacker who, uh, well, they basically uh, tell all their secrets. So if you think about it, if, you're, if you have access to, or if you've written some malicious code, and you want to spread that code out into the world, and you want people to use it and run it, how do you go about that? I mean, there's like classic ways of, like you put it on a USB stick, and you show up at their offices and you leave it in the lounge, that's, that's a lot of effort. Like how many USB sticks do you have to get? Like how many offices do you have to visit to actually distribute your code? And another classic way is sending an email to people and try to get them to open an attachment. But most of the email services, they block those messages now. So um, the, the sort of core idea of this article was, well, there's actually a different way of distributing code. And it's, it, it, it has, um, you can do it as a scale that's completely beyond um, delivering USB sticks. Uh, so basically, uh, this story uh, tells the fictional story of a malicious package on NPM. Uh, the, uh, the idea is to just create a very, very simple package that does something that people like, like um, putting colors in a terminal for text. And then you just go around on GitHub and you make PRs. And if you just find someone who accepts a PR of your malicious package, they bring that dependency in and they publish a new version, suddenly thousands, even hundreds of thousands of people are downloading and running your malicious code. That's how simple it is. It just takes a single package doing it. Uh, yet last year in Stockholm, Jacek Korolikowski talked about uh, this problem as well. Um, and I really like this. Uh, why not look into the libraries? And I also want to mention my old colleague, Maciej Mansfeld. He had a great talk at Ruby Kaigi about like, how do you actually take over uh, a Ruby gem? And he gives plenty of examples. He has also uploaded some malicious packages to Ruby gems and then recommended people not to download them. So one of the big problems is transitive dependencies. I mean, um, most of us, we just ignore 
transitive dependencies. Uh, when we uh, install a new package, we, ha we have a strong idea of what we're installing. I'm installing Phoenix. But then it doesn't actually tell me that it's also installing a bunch of other dependencies that are dependencies of Phoenix. There's a bunch of transitive dependencies. There's no pop-up, there's no prompt that says, hey, do you realize that you're also installing these other eight packages? Um, I mean, we, I, I said this earlier today, but like we are security aware. If someone says, hey, just curl this URL and then pipe it into bash, we're gonna be like, no, 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 no. You're not gonna get me that easily. I'm not just gonna run code that I haven't seen. And then we run npm install blindly. And we just download millions of lines of code and run it on our machines. So I think like, a lot of that information is available. I mean, you have the information about transitive dependencies in, in your lock file. You see them get downloaded. The information is there, but it's not very visible. Um, there's a great article called Small World with High Risks, and it has this really scary quote. Now, again, the numbers always get a little bit exaggerated for NPM, but basically, installing the average package introduces implicit trust in 79 part, uh, third party packages. You've downloaded 79 third party packages that you don't know what they are or what they're doing. And it also, um, does some math and looks at like the, the full dependency hierarchy graph or whatever, and it makes the, uh, draws the conclusion that a very small number of compromised maintainer accounts is enough to inject malware into the majority of all packages. It just takes a few packages getting taken over uh, to spread that malicious code across the NPM ecosystem. And this, um, I'd say the hex doesn't really have as extreme of a problem, but that doesn't mean that there's no problem. So what do those attacks look like? Um, first of all, you have to distribute your malicious code. And there's a couple of different ways of doing it. Um, typo squatting is a fairly simple one that I'm not sure how effective it is, but it's definitely something you can do in some package registries. Uh, basically, you just create a package, you might just copy, paste, clone the entire Phoenix code base, add some malicious code, and then upload it as Phoenix, but spelled with the O and E flipped. And then hope that eventually someone's gonna misspell and download your package. Another way is um, the way the uh, article I mentioned before suggested that you make a malicious dependency and you get someone to install it in, or add it to their package. Um, one thing that has been has been happening is uh, just compromised credentials. There are like so many data dumps just filled with usernames and passwords, and unfortunately, a lot of them are still in use. Um, and then finally, I think this is the best one. Uh, it's just offering to maintain a package. Just go out on, on GitHub, and there's so many people who are just, uh, they don't have time to maintain their packages, and people keep making issues and complaining and asking for things. Just go out there and say, hey, I can help you out. And someone's going to give you access to the package. You can, you can make even a little bit more of an effort and just fix a few bugs in that repo. And they're going to be happy to hand over access to you. Um, I don't think that's, that's not necessarily a problem in and of itself. But it's, um, it's something that you definitely have to be aware of. And so these, these sort of attacks can be, they can be intentional or they can be accidental. A uh, great example is, of course, uh, LeftPad, where um, uh, a maintainer unpublished a package from NPM. And this was one of those micro packages that was used by everyone. All it did was, it was called LeftPad, so it padded strings to the left. That's what it did. And it brought down like half the internet. Every CI system just broke down because it couldn't download the packages that it expected to be able to download. Um, and that caused a huge amount of damage uh, in uh, wasted man hours, et cetera. And then it's easy to think of attacks as, you know, it's just someone, it's, it's actually like this professional trying to make money off of it. But there's also the risk of people just trying to destroy things. So uh, I'm trying to create like a threat picture here. There's a lot of stuff to worry about. And it's easy to think that, oh, it's fine. Um, 
if I just have dev dependencies, those are not a problem because I only run them locally. It's not something I run in production. But when you look at you know, the different kinds of malicious code that you can distribute with packages, you do have um, the runtime style malicious code, which would be something like adding a backdoor into a server. But you also have compile time um, attacks. And um, an example of that would be stealing credentials on the local machine or uh, rewriting the code in the directory where uh, the package is. It can, like at compile time, say for Elixir, you can actually you can run code and you can look at other packages and you can modify them. You can look at the system, you can modify it. Um, if you're running everything as your user, it has access to the things that your user has access to. So to be a little bit more specific, let's look at some attacks that have happened. So one uh, very public one was ESLIN scope. And uh, as you can see, the package, when it was installed as a post install hook, it downloaded and executed code uh, from Pastebin, and it looked at a file on the computer, uh, the .npmrc file. If you install, or if you log in with npm uh, on your command line, it creates an API token and it saves it in the file. So uh, this package would find all of those API tokens and send them somewhere. And so that person was just harvesting npm tokens and was then able to, or would have been able to, um, upload malicious code across the uh, NPM registry. Now, fortunately, this was discovered very, very quickly because the attacker had made a mistake. The uh, post install script actually uh, errored out sometimes because it was doing some async stuff and it had a race condition, basically. So uh, someone noticed that when they were installing their packages, it was throwing errors and they looked into why. And so um, the same day, NPM actually uh, revoked every single API token uh, on the entire registry. And this happened because the maintain maintainer had reused a password from a different service that had been breached. Uh, another one is event stream. Now this one's a little bit more uh, sophisticated. So in this case, it scanned the computer for Bitcoin wallets and sent credentials to the attacker server, but it would only run in production mode, not in test mode, and it would only run if the Bitcoin wallet contained enough money for it to be worth it. So this, one's, this one was a little bit more dis difficult to discover. It took two months for someone to figure this out. It was out on the registry for two months. I actually installed this package uh, on my machine, I remember. I didn't have any Bitcoin wallets, it's fine. And oh yeah, and the malicious code was only available in the pre-compiled uh, files. So if you use the source, the original source code, you were fine, but in the pre-compiled uh, or minified code, that's where uh, the malicious code was. And then finally, here's the Ruby gem, which uh, is an example of the sort of runtime attack. So bootstrap SAS would monkey patch Rails to eval a special header if it's found in a request. So a request comes in, if that contains a special header key, it would eval whatever is in the header value, and that just gives you remote code execution. And that was also discovered the same day, luckily. But so how, how are these attacks discovered, and what can you do to avoid these problems, um, and, and who, who can solve these problems for you? So first, uh, like obviously you wanna look at hex. Hex is a, a great place because that's where all the dependencies are. But let's face it, it's run by uh, people who have day jobs. Like Eric's sitting right here, uh, like Wojtek and, and Todd's also, yeah, also sitting here. So these are people who do it, hopefully because they think it's fun, um, but at least they're, they're doing it for, for all of us. And, and um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna get to that later too, but I hope that you will actually I'm, I'm hoping that you're gonna help them out a little bit. Um, but hex does do some things. So typo squatting is prevented by hex, uh, which is a great, great feature. And uh, republishing and unpublishing is limited. I think it's something like if you create a new package, you can only republish for 24 hours. And if it's a new version, it's only for an hour or something. So there's some limitations. But then what can you do? So you can run some static analysis tools. You can look for CVEs. You've got like, you've got tooling for that. 
Uh, you can work on your infrastructure to make sure that if you do run malicious code, uh, it's limited in what it can do. Uh, but the last thing, and the most important one, is auditing dependencies. So that means reviewing a package before you add it, and it means reviewing dependency updates. And the last part is what we're going to keep talking about, which is, which is diffing. Um, so diffing, basically the idea is before you uh, in, uh, update a new package version, before you install that new package version, you check what happened since the last version. So what's new? What are you installing into your, uh, uh, into your server? So uh, one question might be like, why can't I just use GitHub? The source code's right there. The new version is there. There's a change log. There's a release. All of the information is there. Why can't I use GitHub? And um, I didn't mention this before, but a lot of the packages that were attacked, the, the ones that uh, I went through, no code was ever published to GitHub you wouldn't be able to find the problem on GitHub because GitHub and the package registry are completely separate. You can upload one version to, to GitHub and a different version to Hex. And so what do you need to do? Well, that means you need to get your code directly from Hex. So that means downloading the package of the, uh, the two, version pack, uh, two versions of the package. You need to unpack those tarballs. You need to run git diff on it and then review uh, the output. And fortunately, the hex team has created a command for this. It's in mix, uh, hex package diff, then the package name, and the versions, and it does exactly that. It downloads the packages, diff is, diffs, and um, cleans everything up after. But, like I mentioned before, I mean, we see, we software engineers, we see laziness as a virtue. We uh, want to make things as easy as possible, and when it comes to security, if you make things easy, that's when security works. If you make things difficult, that's when people put post-its of their passwords on their screens. And that's where diff.hex.pm comes in, or hex diff. So just really briefly, at my last job, we did review our version dependency bumps. And uh, my colleagues made a web-based differ for Ruby, so uh, the, uh, which simplified the work a lot, and I wanted to do the same thing, so uh, I made a very simple version of this for myself. But I didn't really see a reason for why I couldn't just share it with everyone else. Um, uh, honestly, I didn't really think anyone was gonna use it. Uh, I thought it was just me. But I put it out there, and I actually, I was surprised that people, there were other people interested in this, and I thought that was really cool. Um, but I also realized that even though I trust me because I wrote the code. I have some level of trust in it. I, there's no reason for everyone else to trust me. And I mean, I just said that you shouldn't trust what's on GitHub. Why should you trust what's on my, my server? Um, so I made an issue on the HexPM uh, repo to uh, have an official one ma maintained by the Hex team. And that's what we built. I got so much help from the Hex team, uh, really amazing, uh, and we built this uh, together. I want to mention uh, some, some prior art for this. So I mentioned that my uh, old colleagues made one for RubyGems, Koditsu, and there's also one for NPM, uh, just web-based differs. So those are also very useful if you're using those languages. Uh, I want to briefly talk about the technical background or how uh, hex diff works. So first, I want to promote the hex core package, which is, is really, really, really useful. It's this collection of functions that let you interact with hex. So you can interact with the API, with the repo, you can download and unpack tarballs. It does everything for you. It's really great. And uh, just having access to this package means you can really experiment with the hex registry. Um, I'm gonna mention that again. So for this, I didn't really have any, or see any reason to bring in a proper database. So it's complete, it runs completely in memory. And these are the two sort of core lookups. So it needs to be able to look up the versions for a certain package. 
and it needs to be able to look at the names. And it does this uh, from an X table. Uh, there's a huge benefit with uh, using X or using in-memory storage for this data. And um, yeah, I'm also getting to that. When I made the, uh, my own version, I made it as easy as possible, and I found this JavaScript package that's called diff2html, which runs in your browser, and it converts the diff into uh, rendered HTML. It's really great, but with large diffs, it freezes up your browser for like 10 seconds, because it does so much work. So one of the things that we looked for was a way to render diffs on the back end to do that uh, work up front, basically. And I found a package on Hex. Again, there's, there's 10,000 packages on Hex. There's a lot of stuff there. So I found a package that does this. Um, the one thing was that it hadn't been tested on that many different diffs, and the format is really complicated. So going back to Hex Core, what I did was I actually downloaded the entirety of the Hex <coughs> package registry and then I ran diff on all of the packages. And uh, I then went, ran uh, this on all the diffs, and I made a list of everything that broke so I could like one by one fix them. So yeah. And this means that, so okay, we generate, we take a, a git diff, we um, parse it and turn it into Elixir data structures, and those can then be rendered into HTML using a Phoenix view and uh, even cached um, and then uh, the best part, uh, it uses Live View. And I'm going to show it off a little bit because I think it's going to work just fine on the conference Wi Fi. So I have it right here. Uh, and it's just, yeah. So it's like really snappy and easy to use. And it even does a little bit of, like, if you misspell Phoenix, it's like, oh, did you mean this? There you go. Uh, and then to get a diff, you click the button, and here you go. Yeah. Uh, and it's got, like, tiny things, like, you can, you can highlight a line and it actually remembers, so you can send this link to someone. And sending the link is one of the big, big things. Is you, you get these shareable links. Um, you can even construct the links uh, using whatever tooling you want. Um, so that's pretty cool. And one benefit of, again, of having all the memory, uh, all the data in memory using uh, S and having that data preloaded and not asking the API is that LiveView will happily like just keep running the same code over and over again, right? So, uh, but with this, you can make it really snappy. Yeah. Let's see if I can go back. Present. There you go. So um, we saw some problems when uh, building this, I think um, Eric found a really funny one, which was, I think pods started in, in the, the nodes that were running. They were just randomly dying from running out of memory. And it turns out that some of these diffs are really, really big. Some of these packages are just huge on hex. And in this case, it would use, try to use 1.4 uh, gigs of memory. But by uh, rewriting everything, and really everything, into the streaming version, Eric was able to reduce it to 130 megabytes. That was pretty cool. And another interesting thing was that the GCP load balancer, it just closes connections after 30 seconds, even if they're active. It doesn't really, it doesn't really care. And LiveView doesn't handle that very well because once the connection closes, the live view process dies. And the live view process contains the state. So even though it reconnects immediately, it just loses the view state. Uh, I think there have been improvements, just the last version or last few versions, uh, that lets you rehydrate state. And you can write that code yourself too, but uh, an easier solution was just to increase the timeout a little bit. So, takeaways. Um, 
I've talked about the, um, the state of dependencies today, which is basically you just download code off the internet and you don't really look at it. You just trust it to, be, to work and to do the right thing. And I talked about the problems that that introduces, the risks uh, that you bring in, the malicious packages that you might be installing, and some of them have been around for a long time before they get caught. And uh, we talked about how to fix that. And that's, that's tooling. That's making uh, security easy. Because if it's not easy, people won't use it. So uh, takeaways. Hexcore is really cool. You should play around with it. You have access to so much uh, data in the registry. I think it, there's a lot of room to build a lot of really cool things using Hexcore. Um, I hope that you will talk to your colleagues about how to work with dependencies in your workplace in a way where it doesn't hurt productivity because it doesn't have to. Uh, just like a really simple example, what if you um, create a GitHub bot that when you, whenever you change a package version in your project, it creates, uh, it, it replies to the PR with a link to the diff. Suddenly that turns it from that, this really annoying thing where you have to go to some other site, you have to put in the package name, you have to select the versions, you have to click diff, and you just get that link automatically. This is possible to do. It's really about improving the tooling. And if we're all working on this together, if we're all helping out, then it's also possible for us to contribute back to the community and report vulnerabilities. And the more people that do this, the safer we are. Yeah. Thank you. Do we want to do some Q&A? Do we have any questions? Sure. Thank you for keeping us safe. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, um, that, that's, a, that's a great thing to point out, and I'm really glad that you did, because I forgot to mention that. That's something that the Hex team has been wanting to build for a while, and that if people are interested, that's, I think, something they'd be interested in getting help with, which is creating a package browser. So that would cover that, that base where, where you're adding a new dependency into your system, and you want to look at what does the code actually look like today. And again, you don't really want to trust GitHub. You want it directly from the source. That's a good, that's a really good thing to point out. Anyone else? It's gotta be a lot. Anyone been infected before? <laughs> yeah, am I the only one who ran, who, who used event stream? Yeah. So question, have you thought about, um, is, is there a way to, because there, there are packages that, that we all, that, that, you know, hundreds of thousands is there a way to mark something as trusted after it's been reviewed to a certain number of times? I mean, that, that would be, uh, I think that's a really good idea. And it would be a great improvement for, uh, for the hex diff. That's something that can be built into it. We could add voting. We could add, um, uh, like, people could do reviews or just up and down votes. Something to indicate that this looks good or this doesn't look good. And then you could have, like, trusted package versions. I think that's a really good idea. And that kind of gets back to this, this idea that I think there's so much we can do with the tooling, with the community, to change this, uh, the state that we're in, to get from the point where we're just blindly running code to where we're actually aware of what we're running. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, um, there is a mix command, mix package fetch, I think, that lets you download a package. Uh, or, yeah, like you said, you can look in, the, in, in your dependencies. That's what you got right now. But, like, yeah, I'm hoping that someone's going to build that package browser. That would be a great addition to Hex.
Thank you.